Good afternoon. Um, the Adams Group is pleased to have with us the researcher Ana Silveira. Ana got her PhD in chemical engineering at the Universidad Nacional del Sur, Argentina, with a collaborative period at the Federal University of Rio, Rio de Janeiro. She is currently doing her postdoctorate program at Codera Lab, New York, United States of America. Her working interests include methodology development in the field of molecular dynamic simulation, as well as calculation of solvation free energy. She is also a former atom researcher, and we are thrilled to welcome her back. So again, welcome, Anna. We are very pleased to have you here, and you now have the stage, albeit virtual, given the current circumstances. Okay, let me share the screen. Um, ah, continue. Do you guys see the... Yes, perfectly. Yes. Okay. Let me... Okay, let me minimize this. <clears throat> okay. So first, thanks, Yamara, for your kind introduction. Um, and thanks, Atoms, for this invitation. Today, I'm going to talk about addressing sampling challenges for free energy calculations. Sorry. Okay. So I'm a postdoc uh, in the Codera Lab. The Codera Lab is part of the Computational Assist and Systems Biology Program of the Slow Catering Institute. The goal of the program is to apply state of the art computational and experimental approaches uh, with the goal of trying to address uh, problems that are relevant to cancer research. The Slow Catering Institute has more than 100 laboratories is this building in the picture. It is located right across the street of the main ho hospital, the Memorial Sloan Catering Hospital, and is part of a tri-institutional PhD computational biology program uh, that recruits students from S uh, SKA and also for Rockefeller University and Wayle Cornell that all these universities are located nearby MSK. So one of the goals of the Codera Lab is to contribute with accelerating drug discovery. In a traditional, and in this case, oversimplified workflow in drug discovery, we will have several stages from uh, this, the discovery of a target to clinical trials. Uh, a target is a druggable protein that plays a, a role in a disease. As an example that most of you are probably familiar with, we could mention the ACE2 receptor which is a protein located in the membrane of human cells. And the coronavirus binds to this receptor as a way to enter into the human body. So once we have a validated target, the next step consists in finding active molecules that could bind in the, uh, to the target to modify its functionality. Um, so once we have uh, an active scaffold, the next step consists in filtering uh, because, because uh, this target to, in the target to hit stage uh, involves screening huge libraries in the order of millions of molecules. So uh, in the hit to lead uh, stage, we have to filter uh, this, uh, large, uh, this, this resulting large set of molecules in order to find molecules with uh, desired properties such as potency, solubility, permeability, etc. Then, in the lead optimization stage, uh, the molecules that are, are the outcome of this heat to lead stage are, are further engineered in order to make like the best uh, therapeutic agent. And this could involve simple, uh, small, not simple, but a small mo uh, modification of the molecule, such as adding a uh, functional group in order to enhance selectivity. Know that the lead optimization stage is the most expensive, both in terms of time and cost. This is because it involves iterative, iterative cycles of synthesis and characterization of the molecules. Currently, uh, the lead optimization uh, involves a lot of human intervention because uh, in general, the, medic the medicinal chemists themselves are the ones that propose these modifications to the, to the molecule. Uh, so this, the success of this stage 
strongly depends on how skilled and experienced the medicinal chemists are. They might use uh, computational approaches such as docking, but one of the main limitations is that docking ranks compounds based on single configuration of the protein and the ligand. And we know that conformational changes of the protein and the ligand might play or play actually an important role. In fact, as it is stated in, that, in the Nature Review 2004, for prediction of compound affinity, none of the docking programs or scoring functions made a useful prediction of ligand binding affinity. A prediction of ligand binding affinity means to predict the dissociation constant on this process. And we know that the property uh, that is related to this, uh, to the dissociation constant is actually the free energy. So uh, this would provide actually the rigorous way to predict if a compound binds the target with high affinity or not. We know also that computational approaches can be very expensive. So the question becomes, which level of accuracy would have an impact on drug discovery? This figure in the left show the distribution of change in binding affinity, in binding free energy, of modification to the lead compound. This curve uh, in blue corresponds to real data from Abbott laboratories. The other, the other curves correspond to uh, computational approaches that we assume that they can do predictive, uh, pre uh, quantitative predictions. The shaded areas correspond to the probability of gaining an order of magnitude in binding affinity. So what we see is that the real data, right? This would be uh, what, a med what medicinal chemists would propose, right? What we see is that this distribution can be modeled as a Gaussian centered at zero, right? So the probability of, of proposing um, changes in a molecule that would imply a gaining affinity uh, of an order of magnitude is only 20%. So here you can see clearly why, right? The lead optimization uh, fails a lot. Now, if you look at the orange uh, curve that is obtained with a computational approach with 2k call per more error, which is quite high, we see that this would imply a gain in, in computational time on a factor of three. So even, even with a computational a, a approach with 2k call per more error, we will be making much more better informed decisions. And now the question becomes, what, what are the factors that determine the accuracy of free energy calculations? These factors are at least three. On one hand, we need a good force field of the system. A force field is the mathematical model that we use uh, to model the, the interactions in the system. We also need a representative ensemble uh, or a representative sample of the ensemble of interest. And also we need to apply an estimator accordingly to which type of sampling are we doing, equilibrium, non-equilibrium. So in this talk, I will focus on the green uh, part of this problem, which is the ensemble, the sampling the ensemble. And I will discuss uh, these two techniques, the expanded ensemble versus replica exchange and the unified free energy dynamics in the framework of these applications of absolute free energy of host guest systems and also for the free energy along the axis of permission of bacterial porins. So the binding free energy <coughs> corresponds to the reversible work of bringing the ligand from solution into the receptor. In molecular simulation, we can compute this, this property efficiently by means of what we call alchemical transformations. Instead of, sim of simulating directly that process of bringing the ligand into the receptor, we simulate the process that, that you see inside the red uh, boxes. In the process in the right, we have that the ligand is being transformed into a non-interacting entity. So in this end state in the bottom, we will have the ligand A, the ligand A decoupled uh, in the complex. To prevent the, the ligand from drifting away from the receptor, we need to add extra forces here depicted as a, as a spring. Then the next step in the thermodynamic cycle 
corresponds to, so sorry, this is corresponds to the uh, free energy that we call in the complex. So, and as I said, because this path uh, involves transforming a, a molecule into something that is not interacting, we say that this is alchemical because the path is not physical. So the next step in the cycle corresponds to bring, to bring in the, the couple ligand from the receptor into the solvent. The, the free energy associated with that part is zero, but we need to account uh, to the process of releasing the restraint. This can be computed analytically. The cycle ends with transforming the ligand, uh, which is non-interacting, right, in this stage, into an interacting uh, molecule again, but now in, in solution. And this is the delta G solvent. With these quantities, we are able to predict the binding free energy by subtracting the, 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 the terms that I just mentioned. Um, it is highly likely that the potential energy characterizing each of the end states will be highly different. And we know that the free energy estimators require overlap between this distribution. This means that we need to add intermediate states in this path in which we will have the receptor and ligand partially interacting. This is usually handled by means of a parameter lambda that will scale the interactions between the ligand and the receptor. And just to give you an example, one of the most uh, popular potential is the soft core potential that models the Lennard-Jones interactions. And you see that lambda enters in, a, in the equation in a non-linear way to avoid numerical instabilities. The important thing is that in the end states, this is when we have the ligand fully interacting and non-interacted, we recover the original terms, which is for the fully interacting ligand, we have the original Lennard-Jones potential. And when it's not interacting, which is lambda equals zero, the, the potential energy will be zero. One way to sample all these intermediate and end states is uh, in the framework of the expanded ensemble. An expanded ensemble is built as a weighted sum over the individual distributions, right? Which we call a sub sub ensemble. And the weights can be, uh, can assume any arbitrary value. In general, uh, this sampling is done by sequentially by intercalated steps uh, of molecular dynamics to sample the conformation, the configuration of the system while keeping fixed lambda. And then we, add, with some frequency, we will have Monte, Monte Carlo steps to make attempts to change lambda. Note that the weights that can be in principle arbitrary enters into the acceptance probability in Monte Carlo, this means that we can tune the weights to achieve certain sampling goals. If, the, if what we want is a uniform sampling on these states, this means that the, free, the, the difference in weight should be equal to the difference in free energy. But of course, this is the property that we are looking for. So in general, this requires an iterative procedure. In 2017, Tan from Rutgers University introduced a method that avoids that iterative uh, procedure. The method is called the self-adjusted mixture sampling that I will refer to as SAMS in the following slides. And uh, in order to solve this problem of the weight determination, he envisioned this problem as an optimization problem that could be solved with a stochastic approximation. In this problem, the objective function is the difference between the observed probabilities of each state with respect to the target, right? We want this to be zero because we want to approach and uh, we want to approach the target probabilities. And this is the, the, the equation. This is a simple equation to update the weights in a simulation that only depends on the iteration. This is called in the literature and in other methods, method, the game factor. So as I said, it depends, it's a simple equation that only depends on the conditional probabilities of observing a thermodynamic state, given that I'm in a configuration, and also depends on the target. As I said before, if the sampling is uniform, this weight will be also a measure of the free energy, 
Most important, these weights are determined on the fly in the simulation, thus saving computational effort. And just a note, uh, we need to make sure that at long times, uh, the weight should be stabilized to make sure that we'll be sampling from the equilibrium distributions. It is pointed out in the paper that SAMs can suffer from co convergence issues. We will have slow conversions of the weight zeta if the initial weights are far away from the optimal weights and this is, actually, it is what happens in the practice because we don't have any information of the system, so we have to initiate with zeros. And also in the case of a large number of states, in the numerical experiments, which are application of statistics, not molecular simulation, uh, it is problematic, this method can be problematic for a number of states of 450 states. Um, TAM suggests us to replace uh, this game factor in the optimal scheme by this gamma that will adopt two decay rates uh, given that we are in, a, in an equilibration stage that is called the burn-in or that we are in the production stage. This figure shows how this game, the game factor gamma looks like for different values of beta. So see that the optimal scheme that is obtained by beta one, the game factor decays very rapidly. As we, uh, the, as we decrease beta, we see that the game factor decays slowly, right? But import, as I said before, what is important is that in the production stage, this, is, this, is, this value, 70,000, is an arbitrary value that I use for just for showing this, this, this figure. But in, in, in the production stage, it's important that all of them approach zero to make sure that we are sampling the equilibrium distribution. In operating tools, which is this, the software that we use, where it's implemented this method as well as replica exchange. I implemented different criteria for determining this burning, burning time to see how this would influence the applications that we are interested in. So to see, to evaluate how SAMS behaves in problems relevant to us, I carry out a systematic study of the self-adjusted mixture sampling SAMS the question is, is it robust, is it efficient in comparison with the other method that we use most of the time, which is replica exchange. In replica exchange, we will have different, we will have several replicas of, this, of the system. Each will have a certain value of the thermodynamic state given by lambda. And at some, with some frequency, we will try attempts of lambda between these replicas. The other question, other question is, which is the impact of beta and if this game factor is good for us, right, for our applications. Also, how the different criteria for changing the burning stage affects our efficiency. And I also compared sparse versus dense alchemical protocols, dense just in the sense of adding more and more intermediate states for the sterics decoupling and for the electrostatics decoupling. We chose to analyze these two systems because they are one, the, the, the figure, the system in the right is much more challenging and the simple in the, in the left is quite simple. We chose these systems because they have been already studied in sample challenges. Sample challenges are blind challenges run by the community in order to assess the quality of the modeling of proteins and ligands. So you can see that the core cubitorial with seven units uh, is expected, actually it is more rigid than the core cubitorial with eight units and also the solutes are much, are, are very different. We have hydroxy adamantane that is a small molecule and kinin for this other example where we expect at least much, uh, more than one binding pose. I will show you the results <coughs> um, in this system by looking at the evolution of the observed probabilities, because recall that this is this what we want to solve, right? We want pro observed probabilities to be close to the target probabilities. And I also selected the most, uh, what I consider the most important result just for, to focus on the takeaway messages here. So in this figure, each line corresponds to the probability, the observed probability of each lambda state along the simulation, the black line corresponds to the target probability. 
So this is a representative of what I observed in general when I was using beta 0.8. What I observed is that it takes a lot of time for the state to reach or to be close to the target probability, so it is not robust at all. Another, another thing that I checked, also in molecular simulation, in, in our, in our uh, applications, is that SAMS scales badly with the number of lambda states. The burning time that you will need is directly proportional to the number of states. Here I'm comparing two cases where I'm using information from replica exchange results to initiate the weights in both the expanded ensemble and SAMS. In the expanded ensemble, the, the difference that the weights are kept fixed along the simulation, right? And we see that SAMS improves significantly the sampling efficiency over the traditional expanded ensemble because see that we very quickly, we reach the target or we are around, right? The target probability in comparison with the, with the expanded ensemble, which takes, for some mistake, takes a lot of time uh, to, to be ensembled. And finally, the figures here, the figure in the right, and showing the typical histogram flatness criteria of 20% or, or, or 50%, and we initiating uh, without any information of the system. So this, these are our satisfactory results as we are spending a reasonable uh, amount of time in the burning. So for non-challenging system, I suggest to use uh, beta 0.6 and this range of the histogram flatness deviation between 0.2 and 0.5, you will be fine. Here I'm showing the free energies computing using the M-bar estimator from the samples in the production stage. The blue curve is the, uh, is the result obtained by using replica exchange. So what we see is that uh, the replica exchange results are more right, smooth. We have a good estimate early on in the simulation in comparison to all the other SAMS results. For, for many of them, such as using the dense alchemical protocol or, the, or, or specifying 20% as the deviation in the flatness history, and we spend like five hours of computational cost in the burning. The burning stage, because it's out of equilibrium, is discarded, right? So we are discarding five hours of computational cost. And for instance, for the other cases, you see that, uh, again, uh, in the at the beginning, right after finishing the burning stage, we have a lot of noise, right? And so here the answer of efficiency and robustness would be use replica exchange because we have a good estimate uh, much earlier uh, in comparison to, to SAMS in a simple system. Now, let's move forward to the more challenging system of the CB8 with quinine. This figure in the, in the left are the visited state, right, along the simulation. And this kind of characterize most of the results I, ob I obtained with in the framework, as I said, of the expanded ensemble at SAMS, as framework, uh, framework I mean we have only a single replica uh, trying to sample all the lambda states. So what happens in most cases is that at some point the simulation gets stuck in a region of the lambda state. We know that when we observe this kind of behavior, we are, uh, this reveals that we might have orthogonal degrees of freedom. This figure in the right depicts what I mean with an orthogonal degree of freedom. An orthogonal degree of freedom is a variable that we, we weren't considering, but that can have barriers of free energy associated. So if we begin the simulation, say in path B, the weights, right? in lambda will be different, it's probably that they will be quite different from the weights obtained if we follow the path uh, A. And I will show you what happens in the simulation actually. So this is again the CB in gray, the host, the CB8, 
and this and the molecule that binds in this uh, in this host is the gas quinine. So we see that it uh, it goes well, right? Sampling lots of conformations. But what happens is that at some point, this is the only configuration. When you see this simulation getting stuck, it's because it's sampling only this configuration with the with the host in this flaring conformation, right? So this result suggests that we could use the radius of gyration to try to capture this orthogonal degree of freedom or slow orthogonal degrees of freedom. The radius of gyration is the mean square distance between the atomic positions with respect to the center, right? This property computed for the CB8, okay? In order to detect this flattened problematic conformation, I measured the distance between the center of mass of the CB8 of the host with respect to the point, right, the center of this bond, this bond that connects the rings in quinine. So these are the results for this system. The columns, the, these first two columns in the left are the sums weights um, for different iterations. Re recall, that the, the, recall that the weights are a measure of the free energy. So here I plotted as, a, as curves for lambda electrostatics and lambda sterics. For different, so these are the weights for different iterations from the weights at uh, right after finishing the burning stage, and green is are the weight of the final uh, at the point of the final iteration, and the green curves corresponds to the result from long simulations of replica exchange. What we want to be see, to be he, to see here is that the the green curve uh, collapsing right with the results of replica exchange, and also it is desirable to not to see this. Huge difference. See, look at the scales here, right? Uh, we 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 don't want to. We don't want this difference after the burning and the final iteration because we cannot make sure that we will be in equilibrium. This third column corresponds to the plot of potent total potential energy against the radius of gyration, right? And the color corresponds to that uh, distance between the center of the host and the and the rings of the guest. Uh, black color means, uh, or, or um, is, uh, is associated with the more flat and problematic conformation. So we see quite a different behavior in these four cases, right? In these four simulations. We see that we are sampling two clusters in phase space with different overlap for different cases. And in some cases, we don't even get to sample the cluster in the left. This is, ref this is reflected also in what happens when visiting the state, right? Because we are indeed sampling different things. So this figure tells us that the radius of gyration effectively reflects that orthogonal degree of freedom uh, behavior. Um, in the case of, of SAMS, the problem was easy to detect because we are, we are sampling a single replica Right, so the problem became evident because uh, at some point the simulation was getting stuck. After realizing that, in some, I went back to a replica exchange results and I observed a very similar thing. These are this uh, the, the same result of potential energy versus rates of gyration for different replicas, and we also see that uh, we have in some replicas we are sampling both clusters with different degree of overlap. See, for instance, this in the bottom, there is almost no overlap. In some, we also are sampling a single cluster, right? Um, and just, I wanted to point out that these flattened conformations are generated when lambda electrostatic, when we don't have any electrostatic interactions, but lambda aesthetics are, are fully coupled. So we can think that as an order disorder, um, transition, right? And another thing that I wanted to point out, which is, uh, this is an observation, not only for SAMS, because I consider SAMS to be part, to be part of the framework of the expanded ensembles. In order to make transitions in lambda, 
right? This pro given by this probability, we depend on a single conformation, right? So the probability of escaping, right, uh, uh, a state in lambda is dependent on a single conformation. While in replica exchange, as we are, are as we are running several replicas of the system, we have so many chances or more chances of escaping. Uh, uh, of escaping uh, problematic conformations. And here I'm showing the free energies, again, computed using M bar, just to, for this case, just to show you what happened. We see that uh, for 60 hours of computational cost, they are not conversed, right? You see that there is a trend here, right? And also they don't, they, they deviate both from each other, right? And, the, and, the, and in, this, in this system, right, which is a host guest system, um, we have, uh, I think, a considerable difference even at the end. Uh, here we want to see for these simple cases, we want to see curves that collapse because when we want to use these systems in proteins, uh, we can expect that things are getting, or will get worse, right? And this is, sorry, this, I'm sorry. Wait, I don't know. So this is how um, I picture what is going on uh, in this case. So what these results reveal is that we also need weights, need weights to account for the sub-ensembles, right, at each lambda. So coming again to the concept of the orthogonal degree of freedom, if we have weights that can successfully right, make transition this path one, right, the, the chances of making transition across the orthogonal degree of freedom will require other weights that will depend on the degree of overlap, right? So um, once we discover this uh, orthogonal degrees of freedom, what we can do. Um, the most obvious thing to do and simple is to use this radius of gyration as a collective variable and try to enhance the sampling by using a harmonic potential that, that depends on, the, on, on this property. The problem here is that I already mentioned, right, that some sense scales bad with the number of the states. So as soon as you include a second dimension in the problem, right, you will have close to a thousand states. In this case, I figure out this collective variable because I, uh, it was obvious from the movie, but what happens in other cases when we cannot figure out what is going on? To tackle this kind of problem, there is this method that is called orthogonal random walk introduced in 2008 that uses the derivative of the potential with respect to lambda as the collective variable. And I have preliminary results to show you how using this. This is the result of using sense uh, in this 2D space of lambda and the rest of gyration. We see that and here, these other figures correspond to the individual histograms. We see that, uh, in fact, using this biasing potential, we get an enhanced sampling of, of lambda. The histogram of the rays of duration is not looking that good as lambda, right? But the most problematic thing is that is the computational cost of sampling this to this space. I had to do 4,000 steps in the burning stage. So this is not useful uh, for drug discovery at all. I will show you a method that I think can be, or is promising for this kind of scenario in the following slides. And these are the results concerning this other question, if the derivative would be a suitable collective variable. So the figures in the left, the column in the, in the first column, is the result that I already showed you with the energy versus the rates of gyration. The figure in the middle corresponds to the energy, but now versus the derivative. And then we have the histogram of the rates of gyration. 
So what we see is that first, we kind of get right a two cluster thing when we observe the same in the rest of gyration. We also see, uh, and this color represent, uh, so green represent the larger radius of gyration, okay? So we see in purple, which are the points associated with larger derivatives, right? So we have larger forces. We see that in fact, we are not sampling, it's difficult, right, to sample this, this region in phase space. It also, we have good correlation also in this second case, where now what is hard to, or, or, or the region that has the larger forces are the one with the largest, uh, the larger radius of gyration and is actually also uh, depicted by the individual histogram. So I think that it is a promising strategy, but I haven't used sums because of the same problem. It is it's gonna be also a 2D problem that I don't want to use sums or, the, or, or replica exchange. And I will discuss again the method that I think uh, it can work uh, better. Now, the other project that I want that I want to, to discuss is the free energy of solute translocation through bacterial purines. The figure in the left is a scheme of the membrane in a gram-negative bacteria. What essentially distinguishes gram-negative bacteria from gram-positive is, is the presence of this outer membrane, which has a very low permeability. The transport of nutrients, water, and ions is orchestrated by these beta proteins known as porins. This is a project in collaboration with Entathic Therapeutics that develops antibiotics. And in the, the figure in the right, you can see an atomistic representation of the OP, OPRD porin embed in a DPPC lipid bilayer. Um, I just, I need to mention that uh, gram-negative bacteria possess both large non-specific, but also very substrate specific porins. And our goal is to predict the permeability of the OPRD substrate specific channel. OPRD belongs to a family of the OCC channels that stands for other membrane carboxylate channel that is responsible for the uptake of basic amino acid and is also uh, has been hypothesized that is also it, it might be the entry portal for carbapenem antibiotics. Carbapenems possess the broadest spectrum of activity and potency against gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. So our goal is to predict permeability for the carbapenem family analogous synthesized by entasic therapeutics and also amino acids. Here I will play you a movie um, that highlights the most important or, or not most important but relevant features that, and you will understand why it's so substrate specific. It, the movie begins with a top view of the porin. So all that bunch of blue nitrogens belongs to um, arginine residues that are located in the side of the channel. And because of the spatial dis uh, uh, disposition, it is called a basic ladder, right? And then we have, this is on the side of the porin, and then we have in the middle, uh, between all these loops, flexible loops in the middle of the protein, we'll ha we have all these residues with the oxygens pointing inwards uh, and in the center of the porin. So the molecule, right, to permeate through it should, should have very specific interactions to, to be favorable. And because of this complexity, the permeation through, through a porin is what we call in simulation a rear event. A rear event uh, happens when we have a system with a, a large error and a free energy barrier in some collective variable. And what happens is that in a traditional molecular dynamic simulation, the simulation will get stuck in local minima. In order to um, to be able to cross this barrier, uh, one of the most popular methods is umbrella sampling, 
where we introduce um, biasing potential and a, a harmonic biasing potential that depends on, on this collective variable uh, that we, we need to specify beforehand. So the first thing that we did was the most simple uh, uh, choice of collective variable that is to use the axis parallel to the axis of this of the channel right so we have two biasing potentials we have a harmonic potential along the axis of permeation are parallel right and we also include uh, a biasing potential in the orthogonal direction to avoid the solute from drifting away from the pouring. So a thermodynamic state will be defined by this combination of the distance along the axis of permeation will be the equilibrium distance in the harmonic potential, the force constant for that particular distance, and the force constant for the orthogonal force. These are preliminary results I obtained with SAMS using now the round trips as burning criteria because I wanted to gather, I wanted to gather uh, as much information as possible in terms of going back and forth in the channel. And the criteria that I consider for, you know, finishing or stopping the simulation was the weights for uh, the weights that would give me zero for the end state of the pouring, so because we have the solute in water in both uh, states, right? What happens is that when I continue the simulation, this free energy, these weights continue changing. So this is related to what we discussed before of the orthogonal degrees of freedom. So this made us redefine the sampling strategies. So last year it was published the first PMF of arginine permeating in this porin, but they use independent umbrella sampling simulations, very expensive simulations, using 100 of states and simulated 200 nanoseconds per state. As I said, this is very expensive, so we need to figure out an approach more useful for drug discovery. So I will discuss these two alternatives of predicting the free energy by coupling the coupling free energies and also by the unified free energy dynamics. What I mean with coupling the coupling free energy is what I show you uh, in the framework of the binding free energy. So our proposal is to compute the coupling the coupling free energy at different levels, right, of the axis of permeation and then compute the difference with respect to the level when the solute is outside the pouring. The great advantage is that we can use our infrastructure of the Codera lab to compute these binding free energies. And this is my results when trying to, um, to uh, Yes, when, when trying to predict the permeability, the, actually the free energy for arginine, right, as, uh, as, as they did it last year. So I should mention that they used Gromos four field and Gromas, Gromax, while, while we use the Amber four fields in OpenMM, so we don't expect uh, like a coincidence, right, between the profiles. What is important is that I was able to predict at least the order of magnitude of the minima and the maximum, and also the configuration that is associated with this global minima. You will see the movie. So this figure, the B, uh, corresponds to this configuration. So uh, we are at least associated, we have the same global minima for the same configuration. One of the limitations or one of the problems um, with umbrella sampling with this approach is that you need to determine uh, an initial path. Uh, so then you initiate the individual umbrella sampling simulations. This is usually done by non-equilibrium molecular dynamics methods such as the steer, steer molecular dynamics. And the problem is that my simulations show that we have multiple paths. So how to account for this, 
right? So what I mean is that the PMF, those profiles will be different from for each of the path, right? How to, to account for that in, in the best or efficient way. So as I, as, I, as I said, one alternative is to use these alchemical transformations as a less expensive way to approximate. Of course, it's gonna be an approximation of the free energy profile. And this, uh, here I'm showing those results that I obtained with SAMS and, and the figure in the, in the right corresponds to this prediction of uh, coupling the coupling free energy for different levels, right, of the porin. So we see that we are able to predict at least this minima and maximum and the, and the order of magnitude, right? So this, the question becomes, is, if in that drug discovery, we need a detailed profile or, or, or a method like that with the key minima and maxima could provide us with a kinetic model, right? So I think that this is a very promising approach for, for, for drug discovery, actually. So, so far we have seen uh, I began the presentation, right, with 1D one, with one problems where we have this lambda hysterics of electrostatics and we saw that when we have a problem with that dimensionality, we can resort to methods such as SAMS, replica exchange, the expanded ensemble. When we add another dimension, things get very complicated and inefficient, right? You can reach a thousand of states very, very easily. Uh, so really, we really need to ask uh, if it is convenient to apply right replica exchange of SAMS. Uh, so I think I will discuss in the in the following slides uh, what I think it can work uh, much better, which is the unified free energy dynamics, and the same discussion of you know how computationally expensive it can get if we add another dimension, as is the case of the porin where we, could, we can resolve, re, uh, resort to metadynamics and this unified energy dynamics, but keeping in mind that the results will be exploratory. exploratory. We cannot uh, assume that we will have uh, converged results when we are talking you know, on these dimensions. So UFED combines the best approaches, right, or approaches that have been successful in different applications, such as the driven adiabatic free energy dynamics, metadynamics, and the local mean force to reconstruct the free energy. And just to show you quickly uh, the origin of this ter term driven adiabatic free energy dynamics. Here I'm showing the equation of motion that most of you know, right? Uh, it is driven because the sampling in the collective variable is driven by an auxiliary, auxiliary, auxiliary variable set, right? Here is the derivative, right? With, with respect to the position. And this variable, has also its own equation of motion. It is adiabatic because the mass associated with this variable is larger than the mass of the physical system, which implies that the time scales, right, of this variable will be also larger than the physical system. So we can decouple this movement. Temporal accelerate because it's a, it's a name uh, given by Eric van den Eyen, um, to a similar approach, right? Is temperature accelerated because that decoupling allows us to use a different temperature, a larger temperature, that helps us to overcome barriers along the CV. And it also uses, uh, this, in the spirit of metadynamics, this Gaussian potential in the auxiliary variable to try to escape from already visited values, also to overcome barriers, right? And here I'm showing uh, results I obtained so far with the translocation of arginine by using UFED, UFED, UFED was um, implemented by, by Charles. So, you know, check this repository if you are interested in implementation and talk to Charles. Um, so here you will see uh, different uh, uh, levels of the porin, how the free energy looks like the uh, transversally, right? So we see that, um, there are reasons, right, that in fact, at, at least at this time are difficult to sample, right? But we saw many paths possible. And this uh, actually, as long as we continue the simulation, we allow the system to sample more and more, we actually begin to see much more possibilities for, the, for arginine as it is permeating through the channel. So what I'm using this right now is to determine 
which paths are the most probable. So then I can make a decision of which path should be considered then to run like uh, individual simulations in 2D or 1D simulations. So I just want, I do, I just want to mention other projects that I'm working on. Um, so I'm working on rock salt with stands for rocks alchemical transformation where we, uh, we are applying dual topology um, alchemical transformations to compute the relative binding free energy between two molecules. This is in collaboration with rocks uh, with uh, OpenAI. And then I'm also working to, uh, in the sampling of the configurational space of kinase. This is our uh, super important to cancer because this, in, this is bosotunib, which, uh, which is a kinase inhibitor, and it's, it is what you, it is chemotherapy, basically. So if any of you is interested in knowing more or, or discussing further all that I presented, please don't hesitate to reach me at uh, anasilveira at coderalab.org. And with this, I want to thank you all for listening, the Atoms Lab for the invitation, the Codera Lab, and my, of course, my PI, John, and particularly to Fred that made it possible for me to work in molecular simulation and also Charles, which is a fundamental. It was an excellent mentor. And what I want to, to actually uh, emphasize about these three people is how they supported the R and how this is important for us to feel well uh, in this job. So thank you all and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you so much, Anna, for this delightful presentation. And it's now time for questions. If you want to ask a question, you can say here or you can write it down in the chat. Anna, uh, very impressed the amount of work that you are doing uh, at the same time. Uh, so congratulations for your nice uh, work. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm curious about a lot of stuff, but uh, um, one is this method dynamics. Uh, you use kind of uh, bias to uh, to uh, drive uh, the the dynamics. But mm -hmm. uh, how you take this off? The, the I mean, I mean, I mean, the dynamics is going to depend on the parameters that you are imposing these uh, method dynamics. No. Yes. The the assumption is that uh, the free energy. Uh, it's going to be uh, equal to the, uh, the amount of bias in potential that you need to, to give to overcome these barriers. There are methods to, to um, uh, reweight, uh, but here, um, because in this case we have the decoupling, we, are, we, are, we assume that the, um, uh, the bias in potential as applied to these auxiliary variables is not going to affect the, the something of the physical variables. But in normal, yeah, it, in normal, in normal metal dynamics, where you apply the bias in potential to the collective variables of the system, what you do is uh, first there are two approaches. There, the traditional, the traditional metal dynamics, um, we, when that has this, this height is you know a, a, a constant. Uh, you take, you know, the profile, you, you take all the biasing that was added to the system and you say, okay, this is like a measure of my free energy profile. Then it was uh, introduced in the literature, the well-tempered metadynamics where um, the height of the, of the Gaussian decreases over time, right? So it's the same to sums. Right, you have a gain factor or, or or height that will decrease with time. So at some point of the simulation, that is not going to change anymore. So you are not adding any Gaussian anymore. So then you can say, you can you can say that you are at, at equilibrium. Okay, interesting. But this is, very... this is you fed this this you should talk to Charles because he implemented this and he's working with Mark Tuckerman on this. Yeah, uh, 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 I'm going to. <laughs> yes, <laughs> also, I like this. one thing that I realized working with these systems, really, if you have a collective variable that you need to bias, you need to apply something like this, a biasing potential that acts on the collective variable itself, right? Because, uh, right, as I, saw, as I show you the results with sums, right, or, or with this discrete 
um, method where you, your biasing potential depends on a force constant and an equilibrium constant, right? But you don't know if that potential will be enough, right? To enhance the sampling, right? On a collective variable. So, so metadynamics is successful because of that, because you add these Gaussians when you sample, when you know that you sample some region or some value of your collective variable. So this is fundamental. If you are working on sampling problems with collective variables, not thermodynamic, right? Variables of lambda, temperature, whatever, you uh -huh. really need to think on this, uh, on, this, on, on this framework of adding biasing directly to the collective variable uh, as long as you sample it. Very, very interesting this. Uh, I'm going to talk with Charles about yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, Fred, may I ask a question? Sure. Very nice presentation, Anna. Very, very nice. Uh, well, I, I have a, a question concerning the, the beginning of the presentation about this SAMS uh, yes. approach. Hmm. Uh, one thing that was interesting to observe is that it seems to converge and then it diverges suddenly. And do you have an explanation for that? Because uh, many mean, of the of the plots that you have shown, it, it, it seems that it's going to converge, and then after it kind of reaches a reasonable. You mean, for instance? You mean, for part, instance? Yeah, yeah. There are many plots like this that you have shown. Like, look, if you if you only look until like about thirty five hours, you would assume that the the plot is converged, but then after that, it just diverges. Exactly. <laughs> yes, I mean, for this case, I think this is a system dependent thing, as I showed you before, uh, all this problem with that degree of freedom, right? I think that uh, the, the fact that we are not tackling directly that degree orthogonal degree of freedom uh, prevents us from reaching uh, conversions uh, in, 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 in this other variable, right? This is related to what, I, what, I, what we discussed here. Yeah, but that was also my impression in the simpler system, or, or maybe I'm wrong. But if if you show the slide of the of the other system, uh, before this one, I think. No, yeah, I think I, no, no, no. Because these are these are pro, these are probabilities. These are, are not free energies. These are the the individual observed probability. Okay, this no, but that was not this plot. Maybe. No, I only I only showed this one. Yeah, that, that's probably the simple, the simple thing. But you see that they are they are not changing. See the scale, right? They are not changing, uh, and they are approaching. Uh, in, in the other case, we have all you know continue changing uh, with time, and, and and they are converging to different values. This is clear here. And what makes this okay? So so maybe maybe you can interpret this result like this. Uh, if you only look until thirty five, it's like you you converge because you did not trans transit to the other state of the orthogonal variable right so it, it's kind of converging because it did not see the other region of the phase space and then after that it suddenly uh, has like a, it's almost like a binary transition it transits to the other state and then it, it like discovers a new space of possibilities and start to diverge Exactly. I mean, because we have that slow transition between those conformations, right? We need a lot of computational time to sample the, the, the real proportions, right? Of that flattened conformation in comparison to the more extended, right? Yes, so, but, it, but in my opinion, it's also the fact that it was, it was locked in one of these states and only after some point it, it kind of discovers the other one and then, and then there is... The, the influence of the second state only after some point. Yes, that, the, the thing is that the other state is actually sample. I mean, before that point where the, where the simulation gets stuck, the other state is also sample, right? But it's not, but it's not stuck at that point. I mean, both that, that flaring configuration is also sample before getting stuck. But then at some point, as you said, the simulation only samples a single configuration, a single binding pose, right? So, yes, I agree with you, but I'm saying that it's not that it discovered a new one. It's, it, it, what happens is that it just gets stuck in one, only one. 
Yes. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. And the, the, that's also interesting that the, the replica exchange value it is converging to the to the values in between the two regions. So if if you take the value at uh, at 35 hours, you have a value of uh, 80, 89. And then if you go to, to 60 hours, it's like 91. And the replica exchange value is exactly in between. Yes, I didn't analyze, as I told you, what I wanted to do, I didn't analyze what would be the free energy if I, for instance, freeze the confirmation, right? I didn't do that to see if I can discern, right? Yes, um, yes. Those two that I, I, I guess they are like two binding poses. But because I focus on trying to, right, enhance the sampling on this variable, right? But as I showed, I, I'm not satisfied with, it, with sums. I, I, I really need, uh, I, I think that we need to do or you fed or something like that to make this, you know, doable. Because, uh, you know, as I said, it's not, uh, it's very difficult to sample a thousand of states or something like that with replica exchange or expanded sample, uh, right? This, this, this figure, right? Uh, I'm working on that, right? On make oh, very, very nice, very, very nice. Uh, uh, there is another question that comes to mind is the fact uh, that you, the, on, the, on the last method, hmm. the, the one that, that Charles implemented mm -hmm. about, uh, about using the adiabatic deep coupling, if mm -hmm. I if I understood it correctly, mm -hmm. you 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 are using adiabatic decoupling in order to enhance the motion in the specified degree of freedom. Like you you have a coordinate, right? And and the motion along this coordinate is enhanced by uh, adiabatic decoupling. Yes, by using an auxiliary variable which has is an extended phase space, you will have the degree of freedom of the physical system and also of an extended variable z, right? So it's an fictitious particle if you want, right? But it's a fictitious particle along the, uh, this, this dimension that you want to, to sample, right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, wait, then... It's a fictitious particle that only moves along the, the, the variable that you want to enhance. Yes, yes, because the potential is an a harmonic potential, right? Yes. Related to that collective variable that you are interested, right? So the movement here will make this to move, or you will be able to escape from values from here. And the decoupled yes. thing allows you, very important, to use a higher temperature to, to be able to cross barriers. Okay, because one thing that it's, a little bit puzzling in my head. Like wh when you do a diabetic decoupling by increasing the mass of the particle, is like it's like the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, right? That right. It, it's justified because the motion of the nuclei are diabetically decoupled from the motion of the electrons. Right. Right. Or maybe when you shoot a cannonball, I mean the the motion of the ball is diabetically decoupled from the molecules in the atmosphere that this ball is moving. Uh, mm -hmm through because the the mass of the cannonball is too big related to the mass of the individual particles it's more or less like this but th there is also a, th there are two questions regarding that it is is how can you ensure a diabetic decoupling and is it a problem if, if the system is too decoupled like you emphasize too much the motion along this particle that the dynamics of the system is uh, somehow, pre uh, how can I say, disturbed up to a level that you are not sampling actu the actual physical system that you would like to sample. Look, you, for, you, did you understand my two questions? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's the question that everybody has, right? Uh, um, I mean, you have ways to measure like the um, transfer of heat from the physical system, right? because you shouldn't have any transfer of heat from the physical system or the opposite, right? So yes. you have methods, you have ways to measure that. Um, but to be honest with you, I haven't focused on, you know, learning all the theory behind because I wanted to first work on the implementation for the purine and see if I was getting something promising, right? Because I've tried so many things. So maybe Charles, if you want to give your input here, 
Charles, are you there? No. I don't know. I don't think so. Charles is now here. Hello. Charles. Yeah. Charles. Can you hear me? Ah. Ah. Okay, I am here. Ah. Okay. Nice. <laughs> So okay. give your give your 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 input from that you know the, the method much better than me. Okay, so uh, you 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 cannot ensure that you have uh, like this adiabatic uh, motion, uh, but uh, you can. Uh, it, it, it will be a good approximation. That, that's the the, the case. Um, you you don't have to 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 have a real uh, diabetic uh, decoupling, but if it, this is a good approximation for uh, obtaining the the free energy, uh, you 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 can like uh, increase uh, you can you you can test the principle. You can increase the mass of this uh, extra variable and see if it the the. Um, the free energy profile you obtain will converge to a, a, a given profile. Uh, you, you, usually you have this convergence uh, way before the, the, the motion is really, or it's uh, a good approximation of the adiabatic, of an adiabatic motion. And, you and, just have and to accelerate, right? And, and then you just have to find a mean to accelerate the sampling along this variable. You don't. You don't have to guarantee that the system is adiabatically decoupled. That, that's what. Yeah. You mean. Yes. It works without a real adiabatic uh, decoupling. It, it's a good approximation. And, and I assume that this is based on my second question: that a real adiabatic decoupling, uh, like a 100% adiabatically decoupled system, will probably will probably be a, be a very bad system. If you take this mass and put to infinity, and then you take the temperature and put to infinity, you will have a completely adiabatically decoupled system. And it will be like a cannonball shooting along this variable without giving enough time for the rest of the system to accommodate along the, the, yeah. the collective variable. That You're would right. be like it, the extreme case, right? Yeah, but it, it would not be practical. So uh, you, you don't want this. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just wondering how, how we could uh, measure the sensitivity of that. I mean, you, you would have to, to make several calculations on a, on a toy system just to explore what is a reasonable mass, what is a reasonable temperature for that. Yes, also, of course, the, the, those settings are highly dependent on the system that you are exploring. So, yes, yes well, if you read the paper, they, for instance, for uh, two ions coming together, they try different K, you know, force constant values, different masses, etc. So, but there, there is an equation also to, for like, you know, uh, they propose, a, uh, they suggest, suggest an equation for the mass, for instance. But of course, all, everything like, you know, uh, like experimental. But again, with this system, I mean, when you apply, in my opinion, when you're working with 2D or 3D, you have to keep in mind that everything is gonna be an approximation just to give a qualitative insight, you know, what is possible, what is not possible, where are the barriers, where, things like that. Not, not, not worrying a lot. Oh, of course, you will see if there are non-physical things happening and you, will make, you need to make sure that there is not, you know, um, high tr uh, energy transfer between the, the, this, the physical and the auxiliary degrees of freedom, but, uh, as Charles says, uh, and also he obtained results for Alan in peptide, and he can comment on that. He, he obtained much better results than well temper or metadynamics. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting and you know useful method. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very problem. interesting. But but you all have to agree with me that all these enhanced sampling methods and trying to improve on the on the sampling. Uh, when you start to to invest too much, it, it always comes to to an engineering solution. I mean, it's always exactly. engineering in the end, right? Exactly, exactly, absolutely, absolutely. And, also, and then you have many parameters to optimize and things like. And that. also, this is a soup. You know, this is, for instance, I'm I'm here. The the uh, three dimensions are the coordinates, right? And we know that actually the the variables 
that uh, are associated with the barriers are not the coordinates, right? So to really enhance the sampling, I should be considering, you know, the salt bridges breaking and forming hydrogen bonds, that kind of thing, right? So we are never, also we need an engineering solution because we are never tackling the system correct, the, the problem correctly, if you want. Again, in the host get system that I show, it's not the radius of gyration that is slow. It, it reflects the slow degree of freedom, but it's related to the interactions that, right? Yeah, sure. So, yes, it's an engineering for, solution for a problem that we don't know very well how to tackle. Very yeah, nice. but, thank but you. The thank you. But the correct system, you cannot solve uh, the, the, the degree of freedom for uh, all these uh, phase space is impossible to solve by that. So, you need something that uh, simplify the problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Everything so, boils down to engineering at the end. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> so thank you so much, Anna, again, for this delightful presentation. And thank you, everyone that was here. And yeah, we're going to wrap it up now because we are long past the time. And you are going to present our next, next presenter. Mm -hmm.